ser gravado. Estamos ao vivo. É Fala agora mesmo. E aí, como é que você está? Tudo bem? Tudo certo. Esse toque aí, semana passada, no... na USP. Ah, foi? Terça-feira ao meio-dia também, no mesmo ano. Isso é um horário, de, é um horário, horário padrão de seminário, terça-feira é, é comum. Né? E Fernando, como é que está? Angelina também? Tudo certo, galera aí. Ah, Fernando está no de férias, né? Tá no camp, summer camp. Vai lá e fica. Sim, é, né? Uhum. Ah, a Angelina está aí fazendo é trabalho. Só... E vocês aí? Você está em casa? Estou ah, em casa, é. Como é que está aí? Tudo fechado? Bom, tá, parece que não tem pandemia nesse, ah, nesse país, né? Assim, é tudo lotado, a cidade, as ruas. O fundão está mais ou menos. O lado lá está funcionando, tudo. Mas muitos Sim. lados continuam fechados. Oi? Menino, calmou, não? Continua. Figura, como sempre. Mas está feliz com o paper, né? Com o JN. Não, não resolveu. E... Bom, eu não sei muito bem como é que funciona isso. Eu não sei se o pessoal do YouTube já está acessando. Até vou ver se eu consigo me informar aqui. E aí a gente dá início aos trabalhos. Deixa eu ver aqui. Vicente, vê se você entra pelo YouTube... O Vicente vai assistir aqui, mas agora que eu vou ser o host, ele vai ter que dar uma outra solução. E a Ó, galera aí, tudo certo? Tudo bem, moçada está bem. Olha, nós estamos ao vivo, as pessoas já estão nos assistindo, a Priscila Ulton diz que está nos vendo o Eduardo também, então estamos em business. Está tudo certo. É, a gente dá mais uns, uns minutinhos e começa. Está no lab? Está, né? É, aqui está mais frio do que aí agora, hein, o Gabriel? Aqui no Rio de Janeiro tem feito aí uns 16, esse inverno carioca. Que fez, fez frio, hein? Não fez? Em São Paulo estava reclamando que tinha feito 6 graus. Tem feito frio. Nas montanhas parece que fez menos 5, menos, menos 10 graus. Ali na, nas agulhas negras. E lá na tua. Na é, tua ali moto. do lado, é. Ali, menos 3. Tendo frio essa semana. E aí, é pessoal? Tudo bem? Que Boa que tarde. Vocês... Oi? O que vocês estavam plantando lá? Congelou tudo? Putz, cara, o café está meio sofrido, coitado. Bom, o Gabriel, você quer compartilhar logo a sua tela para a gente só sentir como é que funciona isso? Eu nunca pilotei esse StreamYard, então eu não... Sou eu que, que, que faço isso, provavelmente, né? Vamos só fazer um testezinho aqui. Olha, eu tá tenho bem. aqui... Isso, adicionar a transmissão. Agora deixa eu ver como é que é fácil isso. Bom, acho que vai... Ainda não está aparecendo aqui para mim o... Engraçado porque... Eu estou aqui como a sua tela, tá, Gabriel? Mas você já está projetando? A... Eu tinha uma hum. imagem aqui. O que, que é? O primeiro slide ou está é, no... O que está que aparecendo? Está tudo preto aqui. Tenta o primeiro... Isso, agora foi. Boa. Tá. Agora eu vou dar play. É. Não, deixa eu te apresentar, talvez, e, e a gente... Não, atar. só deixa eu ver se está funcionando. E agora? É, voltou a ficar preto. Ih, então, não está dando certo isso. Ó, aqui eu tô, estou tô vendo. Tá? Mas parece estar tá numa forma que não é a forma de apresentação. Pois é, aí eu dou play e fica preto. É, isso que está acontecendo. Estranho. É, vamos ver então. 
trazer um outro computador aqui para eu poder acompanhar pelo... Apesar do que eu acho que eu estou recebendo as mensagens do YouTube aqui, eu acho que está tudo bem. Eu, eu não tenho duas telas, eu estou vendo a lista com o que vocês falam aqui, e tenho essa tela que eu vejo o Gabriel. Tá, agora tá, tu está vendo o... Isso, deixa eu botar, adicionar a transmissão. Eu estou vendo, somos nós em loop. Agora entrou a sua apresentação. E agora eu vou dar play e deve dar certo. Foi. Foi? Maravilha. Então é isso. Isso aí. Beleza. Então, beleza. Bom... Boa tarde a todos. É um prazer receber o Gabriel Vitória, um pesquisador único, excepcional, um amigo diletíssimo. É muito bom tê-lo aqui, Gabriel. Hoje eu estou substituindo a, a Letícia, ela me pediu para ser um anfitrião. Então, Letícia, é, é um prazer também te substituir aqui. Bom, o Gabriel... É, é, tem uma, uma trajetória, vou chamar de curiosa, porque o Gabriel fez a formação dele em, em música, em piano clássico, era um concertista, tocou na Carnegie Hall, e um pianista é, premiado. E, e aí, num determinado momento da vida optou por fazer uma mudança. Lembra um pouco a história do, do Alberto Nóbrega, que, que é matemático e, e decidiu estudar imunologia. O Gabriel, músico, decidiu estudar imunologia, fez um mestrado na USP, na USP e é, não recebeu uma bolsa é, de doutorado para continuar os estudos aqui no Brasil e decidiu, então, até, seguir pelo Atlântico Norte, até chegar em Nova York, e fez, então, um doutorado com Michael Dustin e com o Michel Nussesvain, e, e teve ali um momento super importante é, para a sua carreira e para a ciência, já estudando os centros germinativos, os germinal centers, e utilizando uma série de abordagens experimentais que a gente vai poder acompanhar de perto hoje. Então, Gabriel, agradeço muito a sua presença sempre, hoje aqui no seminário, recebendo alunos brasileiros, fazendo colaborações, vindo à SPI e discutindo política, futebol, é sempre um prazer tê-lo por perto. Gabriel, um grande abraço, segue aí a, o estágio que é seu. Valeu, obrigado, Marcelo. É sempre bom conversar com o pessoal do Brasil. Pena que, pena que não é em pessoa, mas eu acho que até o, o lado bom desses seminários de, de Zoom é que a gente consegue, não precisa, é, é muito mais fácil ter acesso né, às pessoas fora do, do Brasil, não precisa viajar, não precisa sair de casa, então tem, tem um lado bom e tem um lado ruim, mas eu estou... Eu sinto eu, falta das nossas cervejas... Isso é, é looking forward, como se diz em inglês, não sei nem falar em português isso, mas, uh, para a próxima SBI, que eu não sei onde é que vai ser nem quando, mas, mas eu estou lá. Então, só, me, só mandar o convite aí. O, eu vou passar para inglês, porque eu, eu gostaria muito de dar o, a palestra em português, mas eu acho que eu vou acabar me atrapalhando. Então, me desculpem aí. Uh, eu acho que a, a Letícia me falou que era em inglês mesmo, então espero que eu, que eu não esteja fazendo uma, uma ofensa a vocês aí, mudando de língua, mas... Fica à vontade. Uh, okay. ok, back to my uh, usual language these days. Um, so I'm going to tell you about um, some of our very recent work uh, on the dynamics of germinal centers. We, we study... Um, the antibody response in the lab and mostly um, centered on this uh, structure here in the middle, the germinal center, where we uh, 
uh, B cells affinity mature and become uh, uh, very good uh, producers, a very good antibody. And this is, uh, I'm sure you know about all of this from listening to Andre uh, talk about these things. Um, but uh, today I'm going to focus on something that we found that I think is, is a little bit different from what you might have heard before, uh, which is related to the end of the germinal center. It's something that we don't really explore very much because uh, we at least find it difficult to, to study um, experimentally. Uh, and also to perhaps surprising role of FOXP3 uh, in, in ending this, uh, um, this reaction. Um, but let me start by just reminding everybody about why, why we study germinal centers and why they are important. Um, this is a, a picture that I like to start uh, talks with. This, this is uh, from Linus Pauling in 1940, when he was trying to understand what it was that an antibody looked like. And um, uh, I think even at the time, they knew that antibodies were very specific. No, people didn't even know what a B cell was back in 1940. So this is, is very much uh, based on the chemistry of the reactions of antibody and serum. But they could already tell some important things about antibodies. So this, for example, uh, is uh, showing what Linus Pauling thought that an antibody binding to a hapton looked like. So this is the antibody molecule here with the stripes. This is an azo uh, uh, hapton attached to a carrier protein down here. And um, the way that, that uh, Pauling envisioned an antibody looking like was sort of this lock and key interaction where the antibody fits uh, to the antigen like a lock fits to a key. Uh, some of this is correct, some is not, but I think it, it illustrates very well um, what uh, what I want to tell you about. And and this is is the what we call the antibody puzzle. How uh, is it that um, an organism can make antibodies that can bind so specifically uh, to all sorts of things? And and this is uh, where it starts. If you think, for example, that uh, these haptons uh, are uh, not natural proteins; these are in, uh, engineered. Um, uh, chemicals that, that are not present in nature, but still uh, our organisms can make antibodies pretty well against these engineered proteins. And this tells you that basically if you can make antibodies to something that, that doesn't exist in nature, you can probably make antibodies to almost anything. Uh, so this is, is sort of uh, an unlimited diversity of antibodies that must exist. But these antibodies have also to be very, very good. So they, this antibody here is fitting very closely around the hapton, saying that, well, um, this close fitting came from the biochemical measurements that they made that said that antibody binds uh, to these haptons very well and it doesn't let go, uh, which is uh, meaning that it has very, very high affinity. Uh, the other uh, characteristic, and this is the one that's most still mostly debated, is that there was this idea that antibodies have to have very high specificity. And this is illustrated here. There's a negative charge in this hapton that is matched by a positive charge in the antibody. And if you were to switch uh, this negative charge to a positive charge, you wouldn't be able to use this antibody anymore. You would have to use a different one. And this tells you there must be as many antibodies as there are um, different antigens to bind to, which means there must be an unlimited diversity, um, which is close enough to the truth. Uh, so the question is, if you need this many antibodies to bind to almost every antigen that you can uh, think of, how do you encode for all of this diversity uh, given the limited size uh, of the genome that you have to, to do all of this? Right? Now, there are a couple of answers to this. One is uh, very well understood by everyone, uh, which is uh, VDJ re re rearrangement. This happens uh, to B cells uh, and T cells before they are exposed to antigen. And this says that part of large diversity of antibodies comes from the fact that they are not a single gene in a single form. Uh, they are uh, made up of different segments. Uh, in, in, in mice, there are about 100 V segments, uh, 8D segments or more, depending on the strain, and 4J segments. And during B cell uh, development, these um, different uh, segments get uh, rearranged semi-stochastically so that the antibody that you have is the product of 100 times 8 times 4 which means in the heavy chain, uh, you have something like a few uh, hundred thousand different combinations. And now these are not precise either. So you have even more uh, variation uh, 
because of, of imprecisions and matching, you also do the same thing to the light chain, uh, which uh, means that in the end, you, you have something like 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 16 different antibodies that you can uh, really start with. So a lot of the diversity comes from this rearrangement process. Now there's a, a, another part of this that is less uh, appreciated, uh, I think because it happens only to B cells and not uh, so much to T cells, but it says that the affinity that you get from VDJ rearrangement isn't the, la the end of the story. Uh, a, a different thing also happens after you see antigen, which is that the uh, affinity of the antibodies for the antigen increases over time. And this was the original work that quantified this by Herman Eisen. Uh, and this is a graph I made based on the tables in his uh, in his original work from 1964 uh, that show uh, that you can uh, get something like a hundredfold increase in the average affinity of serum uh, if uh, you immunize an animal with a, a, a haptin and just wait. So over time, the antibodies that are made uh, against this uh, haptin increase and get better and better uh, with respect to their affinity. Uh, this means that there is some learning to ha that happens after antigen is exposed, after the, the system is exposed to antigen. So it's not the pre-existing diversity, but you also have uh, a post-immunization uh, learning uh, um, uh, period where it is that you develop the really high affinity antibodies that uh, are so protective against uh, a number of diseases. Now, this was 1964. This was, again, before B cells were even discovered by Max Cooper in, in 1965. So uh, since then, this has been more than 50 years, uh, we have learned quite a bit about the cellular basis of this affinity maturation. Uh, and this is just some uh, uh, summary of how, how this works. Uh, you start, uh, before you see antigen, there is this pre-immune uh, repertoire, which is uh, the result of VDJ recombination. Um, when antigen comes into the system, it's usually not a perfect match to the antibodies that exist. And I sort of color coded this here. Uh, you have a, a, a red antigen that comes in, it can't find a red B cell, but it can find a cell that's close enough to red. And that's enough to trigger this B cell uh, to engage in the immune response. Some of these B cells uh, become plasma cells and these are gonna go on to secrete to the first wave of low affinity antibody that was in, in the three weeks and that two weeks and that uh, Herman Eisen graph that I just showed you. But importantly for us, uh, there is a second population of B cells that originates from this founder uh, cell that goes back into the center of the B cell follicle and begins to proliferate uh, very, very rapidly. And really the amazing thing that these B cells do is that they start to mutate their own genome. So they express uh, this uh, somatic heart mutation uh, enzyme AID. This is a mutator enzyme. It has a very good specificity for uh, the immunoglobulin genes. So it starts to introduce point mutations uh, more specifically or, or actually more abundantly in the germinal center into the uh, VDJ region of the antibody gene in the heavy and light chains. Uh, and these mutations are random. So um, many of them are not going to do anything. Some of them are going to make the antibody worse. Uh, but occasionally you have some mutations that are going to improve the affinity of the of B cell, bringing it closer to binding the, this red antigen here. And again, uh, in the color coding. Um, now, uh, what the germinal center can do is it, uh, because there's antigen present in, in the structure, it can select from among this population mutants and it can pick out the ones that are uh, best suited to binding the antigen and make these cells proliferate more uh, than the other cells would. And if you do this over and over, uh, like in Darwinian selection, you end up with uh, an enrichment for the high affinity uh, population uh, within the germinal center. Uh, and now this is very prototypical Darwinian selection. What Darwin framed his selection as was, was uh, descent with random uh, modification, and this is what AID does, followed by some sort of fitness-based selection. This is what the antigen uh, and the whole germinal center is good at doing. And if you do this over and over, you end up enriching for fitness among the population. Now, because some of these cells uh, in the germinal center are exit in, uh, in the form of plasma cells, uh, throughout this response, uh, you start with plasma cells that are low affinity, uh, and then you end up with plasma cells that are higher affinity. And this is what explains that increase uh, in the affinity of the serum antibody from the Herman Eisen uh, plot. So uh, basically, one way to think of the germinal center is, is as this sort of machine or algorithm that uh, improves the affinity. It takes in a low affinity B cell uh, as an input, you know, evolves it over time 
uh, over many rounds of proliferation with mutation and, and selection, and then outputs a, a high affinity B cell, right? Now, one thing that is obvious from all of this is that uh, the longer the germinal center lasts, uh, the better it will be at producing uh, uh, high affinity cells, just because you need to keep iterating this evolutionary process. And the more times you do this, uh, the more efficient you're going to be at generating uh, high affinity B cells. And, and one extreme example of this is work done by uh, Michelle Nussenzweig and others on the HIV field, uh, where the, the very good broad neutralizing binders to HIV sometimes have uh, something like 100 mutations out of 300 uh, base pairs uh, in the, the heavy chain. So this process can be very, very efficient. Um, but one thing we do not understand very well is what um, factors contribute to how long uh, the germinal center lasts. Uh, so we understand the kinetics of germinal center formation very well. Uh, we know that germinal centers form at around um, seven days or so after exposure to antigen, a little bit more if it's a viral infection. Uh, we know how it forms. We know this the, the, the whole um, uh, sort of choreography that the bees have to go through moving to the T-cell border to get help, going back to the germinal center. Um, and one of the reasons we know that about uh, this so well is that these responses are fairly synchronized. So everything happens at, at a, a, a sort of a, a, a very narrow a period of time early after exposure to antigen. Now, what we uh, don't understand is how the germinal center ends. And part of the reason for this is that the germinal center doesn't all end at the same time. They end sort of slowly over time. And it varies a lot depending on how you expose uh, the system to antigen. So for example, for the same protein, like NP over hapton protein, for example, if you use if you deliver it as a soluble boost after uh, a T cell protein prime, you get this very quick developing germinal center. It uh, is very synchronized at the beginning, and then it tapers off, and then it's done by about two weeks uh, after immunization. If instead of giving a soluble boost, you just prime the the, the mouse with the, the same antigen. Uh, in in a weak alum, like inject, this is the one where that we usually use in the lab. You get a germinal center that that isn't as large as the boost, but it lasts for a little bit longer, and it, it tends to uh, decrease at about three weeks uh, after uh, injection in, in the NP system. Uh, now, you can make this last longer by doing things like changing the adjuvant, for example. So if you use complete Freund's adjuvant, or if you use L-hydrogel, which is a, a more immunogenic uh, form of alum, you can get the same germinal center to the same uh, hapton protein to last for much longer. And, and here with L-hydrogel, for example, we can chase germinal centers down to five weeks and even, even more than that. Uh, so our question is why, why? What, what is the difference between these things? Is it just a matter of parking antigen in the lymph node or having an antigen depot? Or does it matter that you're stimulating uh, the cells with more or less inflammatory conditions? What are uh, the factors that um, uh, determine how long germinal centers last has been a question that we've been interesting in for, for, for a while. So I'm going to tell you about one thing that we found that uh, we think is one of the first factors that uh, we know of that, that uh, helps uh, to determine when the contraction happens. Now, this started uh, many years ago when I was a, a graduate student uh, with Mike Dustin's lab. And this was um, in 2007 that we made this first movie. Just to tell you just, just how long these, these kinds of projects can take. Um, what I did uh, in, in Mike's lab was we had access to these uh, FOXB3 GFP mice that were made by uh, Vijay Kuchar at Harvard. And uh, we were using them for a different project. I decided, well, let me have a look at germinal centers just to see uh, what's going on there. And to my surprise at the time, when we image a germinal center here, the follicular dendritic cell network with the antigen is in red. Um, we saw uh, that these were full of these FOXB3 uh, positive T cells that people didn't know of uh, at the time. Now, I thought this was very interested, uh, interesting. I, I decided uh, to work on this a little bit. We looked by fax. We sort of thought we could find these cells by flow cytometry. Um, but then I, I sort of dropped this because I had other uh, projects that I had to focus on. And uh, in a way, it was good that I did because if I hadn't uh, dropped it, I would have been scooped by uh, many groups because a few uh, years after that, um, three different groups, um, Carola Vinuesa, Cheng Dong, and Luis Grasa, uh, uh, described this population of uh, regulatory T cells uh, that they called TFR cells, T follicular regulatory cells that are present in germinal centers. And uh, 
these cells are a very well characterized population at this point. Um, they are FOXP3 positive. Uh, they express some level of um, uh, TFH, T follicular helper markers that uh, help guide them to the, the germinal center, like CXCR5, uh, and also PD1, which is an important marker of the TFH lineage. And they are also BCL6 positive, and this is a transcription factor that TFHs um, uh, express. Um, one of the uh, important sort of findings in the field is that this population of TFRs is derived from Tregs. So they are not TFHs that acquire FOXB3, they are Tregs that acquire a TFH program. And most of these are thymic Tregs uh, that differentiate into this TFR phenotype. So they come from the thymus as Tregs and then they enter the thymus, but there are some data that more recently coming from uh, Michelle Linterman's lab that says you can get a peripherally induced Treg uh, depending on the adjuvant you use to end, to become a TFR as well. Now, uh, these cells are thought to have multiple functions. Uh, some of the described functions are they prevent autoantibodies from arising. They, this is particularly important. It seems they control the, the class switching to IgE, and they might impact the specificity of the cells in the germinal center. But uh, they don't seem to have any obvious function in germinal center termination. And this is uh, some work from Peter Sage's lab that shows that um, uh, most of the impact that the TFR population has is during the formation of the germinal center and not so much uh, later on. But uh, when we started this project, we didn't know about these data. So we, this, this is what we first uh, started to investigate, whether TFR or whether FOXB3 expressing uh, T cells could have a role in uh, uh, the ending of the germinal center, which was this phenomenon that we uh, were so puzzled about. So this is when uh, Johanna Jakobsen came into the lab. Uh, she is a, a, now a research associate. She was a postdoc uh, uh, from uh, Norway uh, for, for many years in the lab. And Johanna's uh, project was to try to understand what role, uh, if any, does FOXP3 play in the shutting down uh, of the germinal center. So the first set of experiments that Johanna started to do was just to try to look, let's do some in vivo imaging and let's see what these FOXP3 expressing cells are doing uh, in the germinal center and see what happens over time. So she started with a sort of a complicated uh, experiment here. This is the prime boost kind of model. And the reason we use prime boost was what I showed you in the beginning, that the kinetics are very tight. The germinal centers show up very precisely at day six. They peak uh, at around uh, day 10. And then by day 14, they're mostly collapsed and they tend to collapse sort of uniformly. And this is why we thought this would be a good uh, place to look. So you take a FOXP3 GFP mouse. This is Vijay Kutru's. You put in uh, red uh, OT2 T cells and blue uh, B18 high uh, B cells. These bind to the Hapton NP. And then you do a prime with OVA and a boost with NP OVA. So the prime recruits the red cells. The boost recruits the red and the blue cells. And then you just image germinal centers uh, over time and ask how much green do you see uh, coming in them at the peak at early on at the peak and, and at the time of dissolution. Uh, and, and this gave us a, a very interesting and very clear answer, uh, which you can see over here. So if you look here at a germinal center, blue are the B cells, red are the T cells. If you look at the peak uh, at day 10, you do see uh, some of these um, uh, green cells in here, but there are not a whole lot of them. So this is a single slice. This is a whole germinal center reconstructed in 3D. And each of these spots here represents a FOXB3 expressing cell in the germinal center. So you see that they're quite sparse at this point. Now, if you just wait and look at day 14, when the germinal centers in this setting are contracting, you see a very different picture. There are quite a lot of these cells in here uh, and they're packed very tightly within uh, this germinal center. And these are some examples here. And if you quantify this over many germinal centers, each, each one uh, of these dots is one germinal center that we imaged. Uh, you see it's, it's very striking that you have uh, a very, uh, what, what we call a surge, uh, sort of an influx or whatever word you want to use, and uh, the you know, peak in the, in the density and in the number of these FOXP3 expressing cells in the germinal center at the time, more or less at the time of dissolution, which we can see here because some of the germinal centers are starting uh, to get smaller again. So closing down the germinal center is associated in time with a surge in uh, the number and density of uh, these FOXP3 expressing cells. Now, here you can already see what problem we have, right? This is not 
a synchronous response. The germinal centers don't all contract at the same time. Uh, so while some are contracting, others are still uh, quite big. And this reflects sort of here that, that you have uh, germinal centers that have a lot of cells in them um, uh, of regulatory uh, or FOXP3 expressing T cells in them and others that don't have a lot. So we can't really tell whether uh, the, the surge in FOXP3 expressing cells comes before the germinal center or uh, after the germinal center contraction. So what Johanna did was she wanted to look at individual germinal centers over time as this uh, contraction uh, process happens. Uh, so what she did was uh, we learned uh, from our colleague at the time at Harvard, um, uh, Mike Carroll, and this is, was back when we were in Boston at MIT. Uh, he had a student, Dan Furl in his lab, a medical student who was developing uh, these windows that you could uh, put onto the, the lymph nodes of mice and so you could do a surgery on the mouse, expose the lymph node, put this window on it, uh, and then you could image the same germinal center in the same mouse uh, over time uh, for a period of, of something like up to two weeks if, if you're very careful and, and in a good experiment. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is a, a germinal center here. Uh, one day after we put on the window, you can see the cells are moving around and happy. There are some blue uh, B cells, the FTCs are red. And Sarah, you can see a few of these green cells in here. Uh, and what you can do with the window is look at the same germinal center here, for example, four days after the window was put in. And this is after there were, has been some contraction of the GC. And you can see a little bit more of these green cells uh, infiltrating this. So, so what this allows you to do is, is make a time series of the same germinal center over time, where you can take a picture every day uh, of the same germinal center or every two days, depending on uh, when, when the weekend falls. Uh, but what these uh, interesting uh, time series told us was, was this, that if you look at the germinal centers and you ask when uh, uh, the peak of the FOXB3 cells happens, uh, you can see in this case, the peak is here at day 16 when the FOXB3 cells are really uh, uh, crammed in here. This peak tends to come before the contraction of the germinal center that happens really here from day uh, 16 to 17. And you can um, quantify this like this. You put the number of FOXP3 cells uh, on one axis. You see that this goes up very sharply uh, up to this peak at day 16. And you can quantify also the volume of the germinal center here in black. And you say, well, the volume is pretty st um, um, stable here. But when the FOXP3 cells hit their peak, that's when the volume goes down and the germinal center contracts. So if you uh, do this, you, you take many germinal centers, their shutdown is not really synchronized in time, but you can artificially synchronize them by lining them up at the day of the FOXP3 peak. So this is, is here, they're lined up, uh, all of the germinal centers are lined up in time uh, in relation to the FOXP3 peak. And you can ask what happens before this peak, what happens after this peak, both in terms of numbers of FOXP3 cells, but also with respect to the volume of the germinal center. And, and this sort of gives you a picture of what's going on. In general, in the days preceding the peak, you have a, a steep in, uh, increase in the number of FOXP3 cells. This is what we call the surge, if you look at the green line. And the black line here tells you that the surge in FOXP3 comes before uh, the contraction of the germinal center. So this puts these things into perspective. The FOXP3 uh, uh, surge doesn't happen after contraction, it happens before contraction, which is what we would need uh, for this to be an important factor uh, in decreasing the size of the germinal center. So, so the cells are there in the right time, right? So the, the surge of the FOXP3 comes at the right time to do something about uh, germinal center contraction. Um, can we say something else about these surging cells? For example, what is their dynamic behavior? Since we can image this, we can actually tell what the ability of these cells is to interact with B cells at different time points. So we wanted to see, can, can we see these FOXP3 cells, especially at the surge, interacting with germinal center B cells. Um, this here is just a positive control to show you that FOXP3 cells can indeed interact with B cells. This isn't a, something that's very clear in the literature, uh, but I think this, this here uh, is, 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 is a good control to show you that this can happen. And this is two days after immunization when the B and the T cells are at the border of the follicle. And this is where the best interactions between B cells and follicular or helper T cells happens we thought that this would be a good place uh, to look for interactions between activated B cells here in blue and FOXB3 cells here in green. And, and we uh, do find quite a bit of interaction here at this point. I'm gonna play this movie, just pay attention to this couple here. Uh, the B cell is sort of wandering around, um, 
dragging this FOXP3 cell behind it. And, and this is very characteristic of these early uh, contacts between B and T cells has been described by many labs, including our lab, but primarily uh, Jason's sister's lab uh, over something like 15 years ago. Um, so, so yes, FOXP3 T cells can interact with B cells uh, early on, but can they do this in the germinal center? And what we found was if you look in the peak germinal center, this is not really something that you can see very much. Um, so if you look at uh, day six after immunization, this is an early uh, germinal center. It's the same at around the peak time. Uh, there is very, very little going on in terms of interaction between green, green and blue cells. So I'll give you one example. If you keep an eye on this uh, blue cell here, it's going to move up a little bit. And here comes a green cell from the bottom. And there it goes. And if you blinked, you would miss this one time frame of contact that there was between these two cells. And this is something that is actually very typical of these early germinal centers. So um, there are FOXB3 cells in there, but we cannot see these cells interact uh, with uh, um, germinal center B cells almost at all. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the dissolution phase, and this is uh, day 14 after immunization, you start to you see a very, very different picture. You look at this FOXB3 positive cell here, for example, interacting with this uh, blue germinal center B cell here. If you just play this movie, well, it's supposed to be moving. Let me go back and try to play it again. Yeah, there it goes. Uh, you see that this green cell is all over uh, this blue cell and this sort of entanglement type of uh, contact as Hai Chi uh, defined this, which is a very typical way in which uh, TFH cells interact with the germinal center B cells in the germinal center. And you can quantify this uh, over many uh, uh, germinal centers. Uh, and each, and, and here I'm plotting the duration of contacts between um, OT2s that are my TFH cells and B cells and FOXB3 cells and B cells. And you can see that in an early GC, um, you have uh, cells that are obviously interacting with the B cells in the TFH population, but not uh, in the FOXB3 population. And you see that there's almost nothing here that, that contacts that last uh, even close to five minutes or longer. But if you look at late germinal centers, this is very different. The, the, the interactions between TFHs and B cells don't change very much, but the interactions of FOXP3 positive T cells and B cells do change a lot. And this is important here. Uh, you start to see behaviors in uh, the FOXP3 cells that look like the behaviors of TFH cells, not like the behaviors of TFR cells. So this is important. We started to suspect from this that maybe these cells that we're looking at are not TFR cells at all. Uh, maybe there's something else. Uh, so we decided to do another experiment. Let's look at the phenotype of these cells uh, in the mice. Um, so we wanted to ask, what is the phenotype of the FOXB3 expressing cells that are inside uh, the germinal center? And for this, we used a technology that I, I developed as a PhD student in, in Michelle Newsom's lab, uh, which is in situ photoactivation, uh, which allows you to sort of tell if where exactly a cell is uh, anatomically by using flow cytometry. So this is just the setup of how we do this. We um, take a mouse that is a photoactivatable GFP transgene. This allows you to, to label cells in a color using a two-photon microscope. Uh, this is a green uh, marker, so we cross it to a FOXP3 RFP uh, to make our cells red. So uh, photoactivated cells are going to be green. Photoactivated cells that express FOXP3 are going to be green and red, which is yellow. And we immunize uh, these with uh, ova and alum. We label the germinal centers and we photoactivate them either at the peak or at the dissolution time to get access to the cells that are inside the germinal center. And this is sort of what one of these looks like. You find the germinal center on the microscope uh, because of the red staining of the follicular dendritic cell network. And then you use a laser to paint the cells in here green. And when you do a, a fax, uh, of this uh, germinal center, you can see that the green cells that you painted are here, and you can see that some of them are FOXP3 negative and some are FOXP3 positive. Uh, now, looking at this, uh, what we found was that what I guess what we expected to find in a way that, that um, early on, uh, the green cells that are not FOXP3 positive are mostly in the TFH gate. That tells us that our photoactivation was good. Um, but uh, what we did find that was uh, uh, somewhat surprising to us was when you looked at the FOXP3 positive cells that were in the gate, most of them actually did not express the CXCR5 and PD-1 markers in enough uh, levels that we could detect them. So this is what we think TFR cells look like. Uh, they are usually not expressing high levels of, of uh, CXCR5 and PD-1. Uh, 
Uh, and this is an agreement with, with many papers that try to gate on these cells using this gate, that they always fall on, on sort of the lower end of the gate, uh, at least most of them. Now, if you look at the late terminal centers, you see something different. You see that, that there are more of them first, and this agrees with that increase in, in um, uh, abundance that I showed you uh, in, our, in the first slides that I, I showed you. So actually here in this terminal center, for example, that we photoactivated, 60% of the cells are FOXP3 positive. So there are more FOXP3 positive cells than negative. And when you look at their phenotype, they're a lot more uh, higher up here. So they look much more like TFHs in terms of their expression of, of CXCR5 uh, and PD-1. And you can uh, quantify this here. This is the amount of CXCR5 and PD-1 expressed by TFH cells early and late. And this is TFR cells early and late. And you see that late TFR or late FOXP3 positive cells look much more than T like TFH cells. So um, this is sort of a summary of what I, I uh, I showed you so far, um, there's a surge in FOXP3 positive cells at the very late uh, stages of the germinal center. Um, if we image germinal centers individually over time, we can see that this surge peaks just before the germinal center starts to shrink. So the cells are there before the shrinking starts. Um, these late uh, FOXP3 positive cells interact with B cells pretty much like TFHs do. So they don't look like TFRs, they look more like TFHs. And this is confirmed by their phenotype, their expression of CXR5 and PD-1 looks much more like TFHs than it looks like TFRs. Okay. So what Johanna and I started to think after looking at these data over and over is, is whether we were just fooling ourselves thinking that these cells were TFRs. Could this surge be really not uh, an increase in the TFR population, but instead, a uh, conversion of uh, TFHs into a state where they express FOXP3, okay? Now, um, because TFRs we know come from the thymus and TFHs come from naive, from FOXP3 cells from the thymus and TFHs come from naive cells, uh, when a germinal center is formed and recruits Tregs and recruits naive cells, these should not match uh, their TCRs because they come from different origins. So we thought that a good way to know if uh, if the surge Fox, late FOXP3 cells came from TFHs was looking at their TCRs to see if they match those of the TFH cells. So we used again in situ photoactivation, the same model, uh, photoactivatable GFP crossed to FOXP3 RFP. We made germinal centers, uh, we photoactivated them, and we sorted the cells from single germinal centers. Uh, and this time what we did was we sorted um, GFP uh, positive photoactivated cells from this germinal center that were um, FOXP3 negative, and we sorted those that were FOXP3 positive into 96 well plates, and then we sequenced the T cell receptors uh, of these cells to see if there is any matching between uh, uh, the positive FOXP3 and the negative FOXP3, which we would take as evidence that there's a conversion between the two types. Um, so this is what our data looks like. Um, we, we take these and put these into pie charts. Um, each uh, slice of this pie chart means one different clone of T cells that we found within uh, this germinal center. The first thing we found was that these are unbelievably diverse. Even though all of these T cells come from the same germinal center, uh, almost every single T cell is a different clone at this point. And this is something we still don't understand. Well. But uh, here, for example, we sequenced 114 uh, cells from this germinal center and we found 93 different clones. So this is a, this, this, this population is unbelievably diverse. Uh, of these clones that we found only once, these cells that we found only once, we color them here in green and in red, green if they are TFHs, red if they are TFRs uh, or FOXP3 positive. And, and we do find some expanded clones, that these are, are clones that we found more than once. We color them here in gray if they come from the same uh, type of cell. So all of these gray cells are exclusively made of TFHs, but we color them in blue when there's a sharing event. Uh, so this is um, one clone in here that tells us that this, this uh, FOXP3 cells and uh, a TFH FOXP3 negative cells can uh, share share the same TCR, which uh, implies that there is some differentiation between the two. Now, if we look at early germinal centers, we find pretty much what people have described. We find um, a lot of TFHs. We find not, uh, variable numbers of cells that we think are TFRs. Uh, we find uh, some expanded clones, but we find very few instances of blue here. There's one uh, couple here and one couple here where we find cells that we can say uh, have a common origin, that they uh, um, um, 
derived from the same precursor. So this here is one, uh, this is another, and, and this is what we expect in early germinal centers. Now, if we look at the late germinal centers, this is day 18, 20 in, in, a, in a primary model, we see a lot more of this blue showing up. And this is where, where this coincides, of course, with, with the surge in FOXP3 positive cells. And you can measure this here. So each one of these is a germinal center. We sequence each one of these symbols. And I'm just quantifying how much blue there is in each one of them. So you find very little blue at the early time point, uh, quite a bit of blue uh, uh, in, in the later time point. And this tells you um, that there is a lot more sharing uh, of TCRs late in, in the germinal center at the surge period, which implies that these cells actually come from one another. And because of the direction of what happens, we have few uh, uh, FOXB3 cells in the beginning and a lot at the end, we can sort of imply the direction of this that says that FOXB3 negative TFH cells must be turning on uh, FOXB3 at the later time points. Um, now this is of course uh, inferred from sequencing. We wanted to have some more direct evidence uh, for this. So what we did was we transferred uh, naive uh, cells from a mouse that was DS red transgenic. This is just to make the cells red, crossed to VJ Kutru's FOXP3 GFP uh, a mouse, but depleted of any green cells. So we first did max selection to take out any CD25 positive, any uh, cells that, that, that were T-reg like, and then we took those cells and we did fax sorting to eliminate every green cell. So we had a very uh, clean population of red cells that were not green. So depleted of, of Treg cells that we transferred into mice and we use this P25 TCR transgenic. This is a different TCR that is uh, specific for something else that is not relevant to our model just to make the these cells more competitive and more likely to enter into germinal centers. Uh, we, we take these mice, we immunize them with OVA uh, in alum. Uh, at uh, day 10, we look at the peak and at day 20, we look at the dissolution in this model. And basically what we do is count how many of the red cells uh, in the germinal centers uh, became green, which is uh, sort of the, the uh, evidence that, that FOXP3 can be turned on from a non-TREG precursor. And this gave us a, a very clear result again. If you look at an early germinal center, uh, in this case here, many red cells made it in. Uh, this, this transfer efficiency is very variable because it, it starts from naive precursors. But you can see here that of these many uh, red cells that got in, you don't find a single one that was green at this early day 10 time point. But if you look at the day 19 time point, uh, which is close to dissolution, uh, in this particular case, there were fewer of these red cells in here, but you could see that quite a few of them uh, had the, the, the green turned on. And, and this is quantifying again, many germinal centers that we imaged uh, early and late time points to show you that this is in this direction. It comes from a germinal center that has no uh, FOXP3 in it and becomes FOXP3 positive over time, uh, implying that the conversion is from FOXP3 negative to FOXP3 positive. So um, we think really that, that these cells are not TFRs. These cells are FOXP3 positive T cells that decided, sorry, FOXP3 negative TFH cells that decided to turn on FOXP3. Uh, we wanted to characterize them a little bit more uh, uh, by uh, RNA sequencing. So we did a single cell RNA seq of photoactivated uh, germinal center T cells, just the same model as I just showed you for the TCR sequencing. Uh, in this case, we also spiked in um, uh, T zone T regs just for reference, and I'm going to show you why this is important in a second. Now, this is what we get from looking at the uh, um, germinal center uh, FOXP3 positive T cells and the T zone spike in. We see uh, two clusters of TFHs, these are very similar to each other. They differ maybe a little bit in the expression of things like CTLA4 or of, of different cytokines. Um, uh, now, we also find uh, some CD8 cells. We don't know what these are important for, but there are quite a bit of them in there. Some of the cells are in cell cycle. But uh, importantly, we find two clusters of Treg cells uh, in this data set. One uh, looks pretty much like naive cells. These are resting sort of Tregs. And then there's another one that is more activated Tregs. And if you look at where these cells come from, looking at our germinal center and the spikins, you see this. If, if we look at the T-zone cells, most of them look like this phenotype here. This is this sort of resting naive uh, Treg state, which most of the T zone Tregs are gonna have because they're not actively responding to, to things. Now, uh, some of these are a little bit more activated in the T zone, and that's also expected. But when you look at the germinal centers, uh, you see something very different. These Tregs are, uh, ex uh, are, are spread sort of all, all around the whole uh, uh, TFH and TFR a space. You see a lot of them in this corner here, and this is the activated Treg. We think these are really the TFR cells. So 
cells that are coming from uh, thymic Tregs and entering the germinal center and acquiring CXCR5 and PD1 uh, look transcriptionally like TFR cells and they zone in in this cluster here. Uh, now, what's important to us is that uh, you see that there's quite a bit of uh, a movement going on in these TFH cells. So if you look at the FOXP3 expressing RFP positive cells uh, in the germinal center, a lot of them actually look much more like TFHs than they look like uh, TFRs. Now, uh, we wanted to ask what are the cells that are living in these clusters here but look like uh, TFH cells? And if you uh, go through the literature and you find uh, all sorts of signatures that people have published, the thing that we found that most looks like these cells in the TFH cluster is what uh, Shimo Sakaguchi's lab defined as uh, GCTFR. This is a cell that is um, CD25 negative, expresses uh, CXCR5 and PD1, uh, and is FOXP3 positive uh, inside, uh, they, 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 they think inside of germinal centers, and this is what this, this population looks like. We don't know if all of our uh, converted cells are exactly this population here, but this seems to be uh, where, where they live. And the reason we know that our, uh, our um, FOXP3 positive TFH cells live in this uh, um, uh, sector of the um, uh, single cell RNA seq plot uh, here is because if you ask where are the expanded clones in this data set, if you sequence the TCRs of these cells and ask where are the clones where one cell expresses a FOXP3 and another one doesn't, you see that most of these clones are living here in these two clusters with only very few uh, cells migrating out of the clusters, especially into this sort of more resting uh, um, Treg type of, of cluster that I showed you before. But very importantly, there is nothing uh, in the cluster where we think the TFRs are. So what I'm trying to tell you with this is that TFH cells um, in the germinal center at the late, late time points, they acquire FOXP3, uh, they gain some features of TFRs that, that we can show in these graphs here, but they do not become TFRs. They uh, actively also really seem to avoid the cluster where the TFRs are. So what this tells us is we're not looking at TFRs, we're looking at TFHs that acquired FOXP3 and acquired some of the features of TFH cells. And this is actually, I think, one of those very important features. They tend to lose the expression of molecules that are required uh, for a T cell help, like for example, uh, IL-21. Uh, so FOXP3 late TFH cells, they remain uh, FOXP3 positive, but they acquire some uh, TFR related properties, uh, mostly of this GCTFR phenotype of Sakaguchi. Um, and what we wanted to understand is, is this sufficient to trigger uh, germinal center regression? So can these play a role in germinal center regression? Quickly here, I'm just going to show you a couple of pieces of data that didn't make it into the paper, but I get asked about this a lot every time I give the seminar. So uh, about how these cells, how do we think these cells differentiate? And we have, we don't know for sure, and this is the reason why we didn't include this in, in our publication. But uh, one thing we think is that the CD80, CTLA4 pathway might be involved in this. So two things are important. If you look at uh, late germinal centers compared to early germinal centers, the expression of CD80 in GCB cells it tends to go up. So this is MFI of CD80 on germinal centers early and late. And if you look at CTLA4 and TFH cells and you ask what's the difference between early and late, you see the same thing. Uh, early, they express a little bit less CTLA4, late, they express more CTLA4. So both of these things are happening at the time of the surge. Uh, uh, the second thing is if we use an antibody to block CD80 uh, at the time when the surge is, is supposedly uh, happening, what we see is that we can prevent uh, the development of these cells. So this is how many of the TFH gate cells express FOXP3. Uh, if you don't do anything, if you give an isotope control, or here if you give anti-CD80. So we think CD80 has some role in, uh, in making these cells turn on FOXP3 at the late germinal center uh, points. And, and, and of course, if this is, if you're losing uh, the expression of FOXP3 by TFH cells, you expect that the germinal center is gonna not contract and this is exactly what you see. If we give anti-CD80 here, uh, counterintuitively, uh, I think you see that germinal centers get bigger instead of smaller at the late time points. Uh, so from this, we think that, that um, uh, CD80 is an important um, uh, contributor to the development of FOXP3 by these cells and, and, and that the development of FOXP3 by these cells uh, affects the size of the germinal center. 
But, but this is very indirect evidence. We wanted to look for something more direct. And, and basically what we wanted to ask was this. If you take a germinal center at a given time point, uh, when the cells do not have FOXB3, the TF8 cells, if you force these TF8 cells to express FOXB3, is this all that you need to shut down the germinal center? So we did a gain of function experiment. And this, we were very fortunate here to collaborate with Sasha Verdensky uh, uh, and Wei Hu uh, in his lab, who had just made this mouse here that they hadn't even published that they yet actually let us use this for the first time, uh, where uh, they introduced FOXP3 uh, gene into the ROSA26 locus after a stop codon. So basically, every cell that has this allele expresses this uh, construct here, but because of the stop codon, they just express a sterile RNA here that's not translated. But if, uh, sorry, this is a transcriptional stop actually. But it, after you delete this transcriptional stop, you, you turn on FOXP3. So uh, you gain expression of FOXP3 and also of a GFP reporter. And, and what we did here was to use CD4 pre ERT2 uh, to make this tamoxifen dependent so that we could turn FOXP3 on in these cells at whatever time we wanted. Uh, and, and this is what we did. We took, a, 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 again, this P25, um, non-competitive uh, host mouse. We transferred into this mouse OT2 cells that expressed um, this allele here, the, the Sasha's allele. Um, then we immunized these mice with uh, NP ova in al hydrogel. And this is important because I told you at the beginning that when you use hydrogel, you make germinal centers that last much, much longer than the ones that you get in our normal alum experiments. So uh, by the time that you would normally see germinal center regression around day 14 or 20, uh, because you used alhydrogel, there's, the germinal center is still going on very healthily at this point and, and not even beginning to contract. So we asked if we get a, a healthy germinal center like this one, we give tamoxifen to the mouse, we make the TFH is now express FOXP3, uh, what is the consequence a few days later? So this is just to tell you a few things about the model and show you that it works. This is a mouse that did not get tamoxifen. So you see here, these are the transferred cells on the top. Uh, they do not express FOXP3 protein. Uh, actually very little at this point, time point, and there's a little bit of FOXP3 here from the endogenous cells. Um, if you give tamoxifen, then you, about two thirds of these cells here uh, will turn on FOXP3. Uh, this will be equivalent to about half of the germinal center or a little bit less. Uh, importantly, they're not expressing more FOXP3 than a cell normally would, because this is the amount of FOXP3 that um, an endogenous cell expresses. This is how much FOXP3 R uh, allele expresses. And this is important because this is not overexpression. It's not giving the cells a function that they would not have. This is just mimicking the amount of FOXP3 that a cell would express naturally. Uh, so if you do this, some changes happen to the cell. So you look here, for example, uh, at uh, gate one here, these are the uh, uh, OT2s that did not respond to tamoxifen and did not turn on a FOXP3. They don't express, for example, CTLA4. But if you look at the green cells here, uh, you see that these cells do turn on CTLA4, uh, and this uh, is quantified over here. Um, if you do single cell RNA seq of the cells that did or did not turn on a FOXP3, you can see that that they are, are changing the expression of uh, this again this Sakaguchi GCTFR uh, signature. So they're becoming more like GCTFRs, especially by losing important TFH genes that are involved in help. And here is just an example; they are losing a little bit of IL21. So this seems to be um, recapitulating very closely um, what uh, the cells are doing in real life when you let them express FOXP3 uh, on their own. Now, uh, for the final experiment, uh, what does this do? Is, is this turning on a FOXP3 uh, ectopically in the middle of a healthy GC enough um, to uh, end the germinal center reaction? And the answer uh, uh, is yes. So if you look here, um, this is the germinal center size in a control where uh, you have Cree, uh, but you don't have the flux allele. This is a different control where you have exactly the same transfer, but you don't get tamoxifen. Uh, in both these cases, you have fairly uh, large germinal centers at 3-4% at, uh, at this day 20. But if we did uh, uh, turn on this allele and made the FOX3 cells express OT2, you see that there's a very significant reduction here in the size of the germinal center uh, uh, cell in these mice, uh, indicating that, that this is all you need if you want to contract a germinal center, you can do this simply by uh, turning on FOXP3 uh, in a TF8 cell and likely by losing the expression of these helper genes like uh, CD40 ligand and IL-21 uh, 
and, and making these cells uh, interact with B cells, but not really deliver the help that the B cells need to continue. So just to summarize uh, the second part, uh, the late FOXB3 uh, T cells shared T cell receptors with TF8 cells. Uh, and they can evolve from transferred and naive FOXP3 negative progenitors. So we, we are pretty sure that these are not TFR cells. These are a different type of cell that uh, is, well, I wouldn't even say a different type of cell. This is a TFH cell that close to the end of the germinal center just turns on uh, FOXP3. Um, and the reason we think they are TFH cells is that they look transcriptionally very much like TFH cells, although they show some evidence of FOXP3 activity, uh, especially in terms of losing uh, some of their T helper cell ability. Um, and finally, as a, in terms of functional experiments, we show that this is basically all a TFH cell needs to do uh, to start uh, uh, to contribute to germinal center contraction. If, if a TFH cell is forced to express a FOXB3, that's enough for germinal centers to start contracting. And we think we really have identified here uh, one of potentially many uh, different factors that contribute to germinal center shutdown. And we hope that this will allow us to study uh, this whole process um, uh, more uh, uh, mechanistically from now on. And, and this is just a cartoon that we put in the journal uh, as a summary of what's going on. We think that that really what's happening at a late germinal center is that you're losing TFHs because they are turning on FOXB3. And this is, is helping the germinal center to contract and to eventually disappear. So uh, just to end, I want to acknowledge the people who did this. Um, uh, Johanna Jakobsen really, really was sort of uh, the prime responsible for all of this. She started working on this many years ago. Uh, she really developed a story that we didn't know where it was going uh, into something where we, where I think, uh, started to identify uh, some different features of how uh, immune reactions uh, tend to finish. Um, uh, Thiago Carvalho, who, sorry, not Carvalho. Thiago Carvalho is another guy in Portugal. <laughs> Thiago Castro is our uh, bioinformatician. He came from, from UFMG, and he did all of bioinformatics analysis in this. Uh, we, this was a very close collaboration with Sasha uh, and with Wei Hu in his lab. And Sasha was really uh, amazing. He gave us a, a mouse that he hadn't published yet. So this is actually going to be the first publication of this mouse. Uh, um, and uh, we learned how to do a single cell RNA-seq from Alex Shalik and Samalan at MIT. Uh, Mike Carroll taught us, Dan Furl, how to, how to use the windows and image sequentially. And we got the very important uh, FOXB3 GFP mouse from VJ uh, at Harvard. And these are all of our uh, sources of funding. So I'm going to stop here. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Maravilha, Gabriel. Obrigado. Opa. A gente está aqui algumas perguntas. Maravilha. Bom, eu, eu vou aproveitar minha condição aqui de host e vou talvez começar aqui por uma pergunta que talvez fuja um pouco assim, do, do cerne da sua apresentação, mas que, tá, é, que é, um, é um dado que me surpreendeu muito, que é essa enorme diversidade de TFAs ou de linfócitos T nesse germinal center. É. Eu queria que você comentasse um pouco a sua impressão sobre isso, porque, em princípio, a gente imaginaria né, que, que fosse, uma, fosse uma conversa entre alguns poucos clones de linfócitos B e alguns poucos clones de linfócitos T. Você vê uma diversidade muito grande é, de linfócitos T. Como é que você é, imagina... É, que, que esteja acontecendo quando a gente pensa nessa ideia de especificidade antigênica, né? É. Bom, eu, eu isso é, é complicado mesmo. A gente é, ficou surpreso quando viu essa quantidade tão grande de, de clones no é, no centro germinativo. É, mas é, uma coisa que a gente sabe é que parece que que, que é isso aí mesmo. Por exemplo, todas elas, a maioria das células tem o fenótipo da TFH. Então, não pode ser que a gente que tem célula entrando no centro germinativo que não devia estar lá. Tá? Então, tem 100 clones, todas essas 100 células expressam CR5 e PD1. Então, elas são TFH. Então, não é falta de segregação uh, anatômica. 
No entanto, se a gente pega os TCRs, eu também não mostrei isso, se a gente clona os TCRs dessas células e expressa eles num hibridoma, que, que expressa o GFP, se ele vê o antígeno dele, e a gente apresenta essas células antígeno da OVA, mais ou menos uma em dez células respondem nesse ensaio. Um pouco mais, talvez uma em cinco. Né? É, eu acho e que o problema é o ensaio, não as células. Eu acho que as células são específicas, só o problema é o ensaio. Eu acho que também os tetrâmeros que a gente usa para identificar essas células não identificam todas as células. E eu acho que existe uma diversidade muito maior de células que são antígenas específicas. Ah, o ensaio in vitro te permite dizer. Né? Só os ensaios que não detectam. Quando a gente olha os linfócitos B, a gente vê muito claramente isso. Eu imagino que a mesma coisa se aplique aos linfócitos T. Ah, Outra coisa, mas uma coisa que a gente vê também é que tem muito intercâmbio de linfócitos T entre centros germinativos. Isso a gente publicou em 2013, num, num outro paper na Science também. Mas quando a gente faz, por exemplo, parabiose entre os dois animais, duas semanas depois da parabiose, metade dos, das, das células T do centro germinativo de um animal vem do outro. Então tem um turnover né, de célula T entre os animais, e isso eu acho que contribui um pouco para não ter uma uma, uma é, expansão com tão grande entre, em cada centro germinativo a célula, talvez expanda e saia e volte, mas o que eu acho mesmo é que a gente está recém começando a entender toda a diversidade que tem nessas células e o que, que elas estão fazendo. Eu acho que é, tem muito mais acontecendo do que, do que esse modelo simples que a gente imagina é, preveja e eu, eu discuto muito com o André por exemplo esse tipo de coisa o André acha que tem uma resposta muito maior não específica contra alto antígeno e eu acho que a gente ainda tem que uh, uh, definir todas essas coisas mas é, um, é uma coisa que surpreende a nós também uh, e eu espero que a gente consiga uh, lidar com essa diversidade toda no futuro a gente tem algumas perguntas aqui Gabriel Deixa eu, deixa eu ver se eu consigo eu selecionar algum... Vou exibir aqui as perguntas. É o Luan, que é aluno da, de doutorado aqui do programa. Você consegue ler, Gabriel? Eu, eu, tenho, eu vejo umas aqui. Our regulatory cytokines produce... Está vendo essa? Né? Não, eu estou vendo uns comentários aqui. Ah, estou vendo. Luan, certo. É. Uhum. Se, se as citocinas regulatórias são produzidas pelas CFH de Fox 3 Bom, uh, quando a gente vê essas CFH de células que, 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 quando a gente olha para elas em, em, em single cell RNA seq o que a gente vê é, é perda, de, perda de, gênero, de expressão de genes. Elas perdem IL-21, elas perdem um pouco da IL-4, elas perdem um pouco, uh, principalmente do, do CD40 ligante, que é muito importante. Uh, então, o, uh, em teoria, o, o que eu acho que está acontecendo, a nossa hipótese do que está acontecendo, é que elas estão perdendo a capacidade de ajudar a célula B, e não ganhando uma capacidade regulatória. Elas não estão, por exemplo, secretando TGF-beta e, e fazendo o, o, o centro germinativo desaparecer. Uh, em, em trans, elas não estão regulando em trans, eu acho que elas estão só perdendo a capacidade de ajudar, isso que faz o Journal Center terminar, e por isso que o Journal Center não termina de vez, ele dá uma, ele dá uma encolhida, ele vai encolhendo aos poucos. Ah, se isso tem alguma coisa a ver com a implementação somática, eu imagino que sim, por causa do que eu falei no início, que, que quanto mais tempo dura o centro germinativo, ou quanto mais a célula B é, prolifera, mais hipermutação vai ter. Então, nesse sentido, sim, se, se tem algum controle direto sobre a hiperpermutação somática via citocinas, eu, eu não sei dizer. Isso a gente não... não, não pelo menos não está descrito no que a gente acha de como as coisas funcionam. Sim. Você está vendo a pergunta do Eduardo Lani, Volk? Estou. Se a interação entre a, as TFH de Fox Positive e as, as células B do Journal Center parar, se pararia a, a expressão, a função uh, do EID? Ok. Eu acho que a, a resposta é a mesma, que 
E ID depende de proliferação, depende de CD40 ligante, talvez dependa também de L21, e como a célula parou de, de produzir essas coisas, vai ser limitada a, a quantidade de uh, estímulo que essa célula T vai dar para a célula B é, é, desempenhar essas funções que ela tem que desempenhar, inclusive uh, a hipornutação. Aqui uma pergunta da Maria, Maria Bélia, professora hum. aqui do departamento. O que que o que que tá ligando o Fox P3? Eu acho que o CD80 parece ser uma das, das, das possibilidades. Eu não sei se é a única a única coisa. Um, um experimento que eu não mostrei porque eu não eu não em geral é, que é in vitro e eu estou focando no em vivo aqui é que se a gente pega as TFA cells e tira elas da sorta elas do germinal center e põe em cultura em vivo um, in vitro desculpa Uh, é muito fácil fazer essas células expressarem em FOXP3 com TGF-beta. A gente bota um pouquinho de TGF-beta ali, 60% dessas células viram FOXP3 positivo em, em, em 3, 4 dias. Então, a gente usou isso como evidência de que é muito fácil fazer o FOXP3 ligar nessas células. Mas, por outro lado, isso também uh, sugere que TGF-beta pode ter uma, uma função nessa... Uh, nessa conversão, e há relatos de que TGF-beta está presente no centro germinativo, um, mesmo fora dos sítios da mucosa, então eu imagino que, que pode ser que o, o TGF-beta seja envolvido nisso também. Uh, é, por que, é. que, que, o, que o centro germinativo resolve fazer esse TGF-beta no final do, da reação, é, eu, eu não sei dizer. Essa também é parecida do Martim Bonamino, o que que induziria o Fox P3? A Priscila ou sem Ah, o que que acontece se a gente continua imunizando? Ah, a gente não fez esse experimento, pela experiência que a gente tem com outros sistemas, ah, parece que essa... Ah, que, a, que a inibição é, é por perda, uma inibição em cis, não em trans. Então, uma segunda imunização recrutaria novas células de memória, células T de fora do centro nativo, e também novas células B, e começaria a reação por cima da primeira de novo. É o que a gente vê quando a gente faz esse tipo de experimento. Então, eu imagino que aquelas células não, talvez não fossem embora, mas não seriam mais relevantes, porque elas seriam overwhelmed por novas células T que entrariam derivadas do do Prime, mas a gente não fez esse experimento. A Maria, acho que ainda em relação à indução de fotos P3, pergunta se dependeria da afinidade de ICR. Eu imagino que sim, porque, e essa é a resposta do Luan também, mais embaixo, uh, por exemplo, a, a OT2, a gente não consegue fazer ela, ela virar Fox P3 positivo. Aquele experimento de transferência de uma célula negativa para virar positiva, a, a UTITU não faz. Uh, mas a célula naive, que é a policlonal, faz. Quando a gente olha os clones de célula naquele experimento do sequenciamento do TCR, volta e meia a gente vê os clones que são grandes, mas que não tem nenhuma célula FOXP3 positiva, enquanto que outros têm. Então, eu imagino que sim, que a afinidade do TCR contribua. É claro que o, que o experimento do OT2 é um pouco difícil de interpretar, porque a OT2 ela tem esse problema de que ela não é uma célula que, que tem a mesma plasticidade. É, por exemplo, é muito difícil fazer uma OT2 virar TH2. E é difícil fazer uma OT2 ligar FOXP3 é, em vivo, a não ser com, com antígeno oral. Então, tem, a OT2 tem alguns uh, problemas, mas eu imagino que sim, que seja dependente da... Não sei se da afinidade ou de alguma... Uh, de alguma uh, propriedade do TCR. O Eduardo tem mais uma pergunta aqui. Se as FOXP3 são exaustas, eu, eu acho que todas as, as TFH são células exaustas. Elas expressam PD1, que é um marcador uh, de exaustão, elas não proliferam, proliferam muito pouco. A gente consegue acordar elas e fazê-las proliferarem. O Michel, o Sensuai, que teve um paper agora mostrando isso. 
usando um, um estímulo externo, mas em geral a proliferação delas, como eu mostrei naquele single cell RNA que é mais ou menos 1% das células estão em ciclo, em ciclo celular. Então eu acho que elas já são exaustas. O que eu acho que está acontecendo, elas estão perdendo a, a capacidade de, de ajudar via CD40 ligante e L21. Uma pergunta do André Vargas. Sim, os modelos crônicos, eu, eu, eu imagino que sim, que as células apareçam nos modelos crônicos, mas que elas vão ser muito difíceis de ver. Quando nós olhamos a influenza, essa é outra história que nós estamos é, trabalhando agora. Um, quando tem um germinal center induzido por influenza, esse germinal center fica lá muito tempo, ele dura meses, mas ele dura meses porque a, a primeira onda de clones vai embora e entra uma segunda onda, parecido com o que o André está descrevendo uh, no, no artigo dele de Zika. Uh, e, e o que acontece é o que um pouco, que eu, como eu falei para a Priscila, uh, sai uma resposta e entra outra, a, a resposta nova vem com as suas próprias células T, então vai ser muito difícil de ver esse, esse aumento do, da, da célula um, T que expressa a FOXP3 num, num, num modelo que não é tão contínuo, que não é tão definido no tempo, que é mais contínuo. O Gabriel, talvez voltando um pouquinho para os basics, de Maduso, que recentemente eu recebi de uma aluna da medicina. Ela perguntava o seguinte, ah, o que, que define... É, que um linfócito B que está no Germinal Center vai um novo ciclo de proliferação ou vai sair o Germinal Center como uma célula efetora? É, se, é, se a gente soubesse isso, teria muito menos trabalho do que tem agora. Tem, é uma área que está muito ativa no momento, parece que a afinidade tem a ver com isso, as células de mais alta afinidade têm maior tendência a sair do, do centro germinativo como plasmócito, as de menor afinidade têm tendência a sair como memória, mas são, isso é tudo tendência, não é, ah, ah, não é nada que é absoluto. Ah, parece que tem um papel importante para a célula T na, na, nisso, porque uma, em, em geral, por exemplo, tem, tem, tem um um artigo recente do Toma Kurosaki que mostra que uh, se a célula B é heterozigota para CD40, ela não faz plasmose. Então, parece que a ajuda da, da célula T é importante. E é uma área de, de, que está muito ativa. Nós ainda estamos aprendendo sobre isso e eu imagino que, que nos próximos anos a gente vai saber mais. E essas células B, Gabriel, elas interagem com diferentes TFAs simultaneamente? Uh, eu imagino que sim, tem pouca evidência disso, porque tem muito mais célula B do que TFA, é mais ou menos 5 para 1 a proporção. Uh, então, nós conseguimos, uh, com o de identificar o contrário, nós vemos duas células B interagindo com a mesma TFA, é mas eu imagino que o contrário também aconteça. É, o seu dado com essa diversidade de T sugere que deve ter umas confusões ali. Né? Certamente o que acontece é uma célula B pode interagir com várias células T sequencialmente, um pouquinho com essa, um pouquinho com essa, e parece que a célula B, de alguma forma, integra o quanto de ajuda que ela recebeu uh, nas, nos, nos últimos minutos, horas, e toma a decisão do que, que ela vai fazer, se ela vai virar um plasmó, se ela vai voltar, se ela vai virar uma célula de memória, baseada nessa integração de ajuda com o tempo. Muito bem. Bom, é, eu queria te agradecer enormemente, é um prazer te rever, Gabriel, e, e ter aqui a, sua, a sua excelência, a, a, essa, essas histórias tão complicadas que você consegue conduzir de maneira tão cristalina, assim, é impressionante essa, essa capacidade que você tem de fazer e de apresentar a ciência. Eu acho que é muito, é muito interessante, muito bacana. Obrigado, Marcelo. Gabriel, valeu, cara, foi ótimo tê-lo aqui. Um abraço. Estamos te esperando aqui, Maravilha. quando acabar a pandemia. Valeu, abração. Um
Pessoal, agradeço a presença de todos, mais uma vez. Grande abraço.